Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on TMD, also known as TMJ, Temporomandibular Joint Disorder. Now, TMJ is just the anatomical landmark, the temporomandibular joint. So TMD is the appropriate term when there's a problem there indicated by the D disorder. Now, TMD is an umbrella term for most of the, well, for all of the problem that, problems that can originate from the joint itself or related musculature and nerves, okay? And most specifically, that we're talking about the joint itself, the muscles of mastication, so that will be the temporalis, masseter, pterygoids, suprahyoid muscles, but also the, also the, the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve problems are common, not rare, guys, common in TMD. And that is because the, the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve, can be entrapped here behind the condyle, the head of the, I hope you can see my pointer, the head of the, the mandible, and be compressed there. It can also be irritated or entrapped as they pierce through the superior, uh, well, through the lateral pterygoid muscles uh, within the muscle tissue itself. And that, uh, and that can cause ear pain, tinnitus, facial symptoms, dysautonom other dysautonomic symptoms like, like excessive lagrimation, uh, nasal discharge. Uh, it can cause uh, pain in the palate, or dysfunction of the palate, abnormal taste sensation. Um, obviously, if we're talking about TMD itself, then pain in the musculature, pain in the joint, all of these are fairly common sequela in TMD. Now, TMD is off, you know, this is an opinionated topic, and I will give you my opinion. There are some alternative practitioners, almost uh, entirely, who claim that TMD can cause all kinds of bodily maladies, that it will cause your spine to be crooked, that it will cause your shoulders and your hips to be uneven, all these, all these kind of issues. And although it is true, I know there is some evidence showing that on, especially or exclusively, to the best of my knowledge, done on, on rats or mice, where they induced malocclusion in these, in, these, uh, in these animals, and that caused spinal scoliosis. But to what extent, I'm not sure. You know, how, how badly did they damage the jaw in these, in these animals, and, and how, how bad were the curves that they saw afterwards? I'm not sure, okay? So I know there's some limited evidence on the topic, but we can just use common sense and look at the patient demographics here. And it's very easy to tell that there's no obvious correlation between a patient that has jaw pain and all kinds of crazy spinal abnormalities from that. This is simply not true, guys. So if, you're, if, you, if you have one of these raging uh, dental clinicians, we're telling you that you're getting all kinds of upper neck, neck, you know, shoulder dysfunction, low back dysfunction from your TMJ problem. There, there's no strong evidence to suggest that, guys. And, and I would say that I have a lot of experience treating these patients successfully. And in my opinion, it is blatant bullshit. I, I don't agree with that whatsoever. There is some suggestive evidence. But when you look clinically with these patients, there's no strong correlation for that whatsoever. Now, with regards to the potential causes of TMD, there is controversy. I think that most conventional clinicians, they agree that TMD is a problem generally pertaining to this area. I don't think there's a lot of controversy there amongst conventional clinicians, but there is some speculation on the alternative side. Yes, there is. However, there is a lot of controversy with regards to the path of mechanism. What is the actual etiology of TMD? And also, there are some issues with regards to diagnosis and even more so with regards to treatment, also in the conventional camps. And we're going to talk about that, and I will give you my opinion, because there's no clear consensus in the literature, guys. So I will tell you my opinion, my experience, and then you will just, and then I'll tell you why, of course. And then you see if that makes sense for you or not. Now, TMD, in essence, is really a problem that causes pain and deterioration of the joint itself. 
that can lead to secondary issues such as dysfunction of the muscles and also impingement of the nerve in the back here, like I talked about, which can cause tertiary problems. Okay, uh, there are many theories with regards to what the, the origin, what is the actual mechanism of the joint, the initial joint degradation. So the, the most common consensus is that there is malocclusion of the teeth. Some even say that there is overactivity, extreme overactivity of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid, and that, that, is, and that this little muscle here is literally pulling the disc and rupturing the retrodiscal ligament in the back. In my opinion, this is an experience this is absolute nonsense. That's not what happens. Now, why is there why are there so many people that believe that malocclusion is the cause of this? Well, because it's a half truth. It's not completely wrong. The thing is that, and this has been published by certain pioneers. I wouldn't say there's a significant consensus on the topic, but I agree with this. John and Mike Mew, Anthony Stems, Brendan Stack, they have shown that craniofacial dystrophy and underdevelopment of the upper jaw causes the jaw, well, if the upper jaw underdevelops, there's not enough space for the teeth to come out and the bite will develop overly posteriorly. So now when you bite your teeth together, obviously you will have the crowding, you will have the imbalance of the teeth, but the entire bite will be situated too far back. So now when you bite together, the condyle here, the head of the jaw, the head of the, head of the mandible, will be situated too far back and it will crush into the back of the joint here and, and compress that retrodiscal ligament, compress the disc and compress the nerve in the back. And this is what causes the joint deterioration. So if we go in and we treat the teeth, we balance the teeth, then we're treating the symptom, we're not treating the cause. Because the real cause would be, well, this is another thing that we're gonna talk about, but the real cause tends to be either underdevelopment of the jaw and overly posteriorly situated uh, occlusion. And if you have a patient where the symptoms of TMD develop in childhood or adolescence, then certainly this should be one of the main things to look at, especially if they have very obvious craniofacial dystrophy. But what if the symptoms develop when you're 35 or 45? The face has been finished with development for 20 years. Can we, do, can we really blame craniofacial dystrophy with, if we have an onset of symptoms 20 years later? Well, stress, we're getting to the straight to the point here, stress is another very common instigator of TMD. Not because the patient is psychiatrically delusional in imagining their symptoms, but because stress tends to cause people to be very tense, clenching the jaw, tensing the suprahyoid, and that can also increase joint shearing, even in patients who have normal facial structures. We're gonna talk about that. Yeah, so it's very important to find out if the symptoms started young age or adult age, and it's also important to find out if the symptoms started after some kind of dental procedure or out of the blue or gradually with development because it could be stress-related, it could be craniofacial dystrophy, or it could be a combination of craniofacial dystrophy as a predisposing factor and then dental treatment, inappropriate dental treatment on top of that, all right? Now, for example, if you have an adult patient who never had TMD before and they underwent some kind of uh, odontological treatment, let's say um, some kind of, uh, of, of, of braces, a lot of adults develop TMD after that. And that's especially because it tends to pull the teeth back. And pulling the teeth back can often cause further retraction of that mandible if it's just one or two millimeters. If you had a little bit of a pore space from, from to begin with, and you pull that mandible now one or two millimeters further back, that can be enough to really compress that disc, compress the auricular temporal nerve, and set off full-blown TMD, all right? So that's an, another important factor. But what about patients who develop this out of the blue? So there was no dental treatment, they have normal facial structure, or at least if they have even if they have abnormal facial structure that they've been fine for 15 years, let's say they're 30 years old or 50, 35 years old, what can it be then? 
Well, in my experience, and this can also happen after some kind of head and neck injury, guys, where in, either instability of the neck causing the patient to cleanse the suprahyoid muscles to stabilize the spine, or, or simply stress, you know, it could be a divorce, it could be abuse, it could be all kinds of things that makes the patient very stressed. And some patients respond to stress by clenching their abdomen or, or butt or groin, and other people respond by clenching their jaw or suprahyoids. And if you choose, you know, if you end up clenching your jaw, then you may develop TMD, especially if you have predisposing factors. Now, temporalis masseter, you know, the typical jaw clenching, I think that's, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. Most people understand that. Something that there's not a lot of information on, almost nothing to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, that is suprahyoid or hyoidal muscle clenching. The hyoid muscles, they open the jaw. They also protect the neck. If, for example, if someone chokes you, you will instinctively clench those to not protect that hand all the way into your windpipe. What I've seen over the course of years now is that when people have stress or cervical instability, so by cervical instability, what I mean is muscle damage in the neck, all right, making your neck weak. Very many... They, they end up clenching those suprahyoid muscles. And this is why so many patients also get TMD after whiplash, because they start clenching these muscles. And as you can see here on the illustration, attaches to the mentum, to the chin, to the hyoid, to the sternum. And when you clench those, pulls the jaw back. And as you can see here, when you pull that jaw back, it pull, you, you directly increase joint shearing. So you start compressing the disc, compressing the nerve in the back, we'll get back to the nerve. And that's where the malady starts. So if we have adults who develop TMD, or, TM, or even if it's children, but it develops after some kind of psychologically traumatic incidents or long-term psychological stress as well, this is something to seriously consider because this, and this might come as a surprise to many, but it has been my experience that this is the most common cause of TMD, more common than the sole craniofacial dystrophy. Because most people today, they grow up with using pacifiers, you know, sucking the thumb, mouth breathing, and they get fake craniofacial dystrophy. And to say that the majority of these patients have TMD, I mean, they, that's simply not true. It's blatantly not true. Blatantly not true. So there must be something more there. And in my experience, maybe some will, be, will disagree, but in my experience, that something, that monstrous something, is clenching, clenching habits, stress, all right? So for these patients, we need to make them aware of their clenching habits and stop them. We're going to get back to that. Now, let's talk a little bit about imaging. Imaging in TMD is, little, it's, not, it's really not rocket science, but it's a little bit... There, there's some missing expertise on the topic, I would say. And there is some, there's certainly a lot of misconception with regards to what is normal and not. Uh, both of these examples here I got from Google. I'm not going to disclose the sources. Maybe I should, but I, I won't. Um, and we have A and B in both of these on the left and right side are claimed to be normal. Now, on the left side here, we have a fairly normal disk. It's a little bit too far forward, okay? It should cover a little bit more of the apex of the condyle, but it's more or less normal. There's no thickening. There's no increased signal. And we have a fairly normal shape. We have a completely normal shape of the, of the head of the mandible, the condyle. We also see that there's a normal joint space. There's a good joint space in the back and above the condyle. And we see when the patient opens their mouth, there's a normal recapturing of the disc on top of the condyle. Completely normal. Well, it's not even a recapturing, actually, because it wasn't off to begin with. It's slightly forward. But this is normal. What would not be normal is when we have disc dislocation without reduction, meaning that you open your mouth, and the disc was in front to begin with, and you open your mouth, and it does not recapture. And that tends to cause locking of the jaw, which is also known as trismus. Now, on the right side here, we have, according to the, to the authors, A and B is normal. But look at the condyle here, guys. 
Look at the difference on the left and right side. You can see the caudal is bent. It's clearly bent. And the head of the caudal is flattened. This is a sign of long-term compression of the joint. This is not normal. They're claiming that this is normal, but this is not normal. The disc here is not even covering half of the condyl, condylar apex, and it extends way in front of the condyl. This is not normal. It's too far forward. And then we can look at another obvious thing. Look at the joint space. Here's the fossa, the posterior wall here. There's no joints, there's no clearance in the joint. Look at the difference here. We have here maybe three, three millimeters. Look here, there's no joint clearance. And that is, of course, why the condyle is deformed to begin with. Now, this is important to know about, guys, because a lot of patients, they can have clinical TMD and actually have a normal MRI. Because sometimes you simply, if you do the imaging too early before any damage has occurred, the imaging will be normal. Or maybe they just have very mild symptoms, very mild provoking factors, and it will never, or at least take a long time before it develops into any frank injury. So it's not uncommon for a patient to undergo imaging and finding that although they have clinical symptoms, obvious clinical symptoms like pain popping in the joint itself, which is obviously TMD and then normal imaging. But another thing to be aware of here, guys, like I'm pointing out here, is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion with regards to what normal really is, because this is not normal. It is not brutally abnormal. We're not saying here that the joint is broken, but it's not normal. And it's important to understand that because it takes years to get condylar reshaping like this. Now, is it possible to have something like this and be asymptomatic? Yes, but that's another discussion, all right? Symptom versus no symptoms on imaging, that's a, that's, that's a very controversial topic. And it's, 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 yeah, I will leave that discussion up to someone else. I don't care. Let's focus on those who have symptoms. Now, let's go down to C and D here. Look at the condyle first and foremost. The condyle is atrophied, clearly deformed. There is considerable damage to the condyle. You can see that there's a little bit of osteophytic development here. And the disc is way in front of the condyle. And you can see here when they open the mouth, it still stays in front. And you can see there's not so much movement. Look at the difference here. Here, the jaw comes all the way in front of the articular process. Do you see that? Here, it doesn't even move in front of, it doesn't even come adjacent to the articular process because they can barely open their mouth. They have disc displacement without reduction. Significant condylar deterioration here. Now, in the last uh, sequence here, E and F, once again, we can see narrow joint space. We can see the disc, which is here by the asterisk. It's not so easy to see, but the disc is here. And when they open the mouth, once again, you can see that the condyle does not surpass the articular process there. It's stuck. It gets stuck here. And the disc is lodged in front of it. So that's what's stopping the opening of the mouth. So what are we looking for here, you know, for the clinicians or the patients, if you're especially, especially interested, we're looking for the shape of the condyle, the shape of the disc. We're looking for the signal of the disc. And we're looking for the, for the joint space. Those are the main things we're looking for. You can also look for something called disc perforation. That would mean that the entire retrodiscal ligament is torn and it's dislodged way, it retracts, and it basically retracts towards the, the origin of the tendon. But that's rare. Personally, I've never seen it. I know it's a thing. I know it can happen, but I've personally never seen it. So that's going to be rare. Even in patients who have severe symptoms, that's going to be rare. Should you have a movement MRI, dynamic MRI? It's not necessary, in my opinion. You need one, you need foot. Open, you need images in closed and open position. That's what you need. And what I usually ask for is a T1 and T2 in, uh, and also PD fat set in the sagittal plane and usually a T2 as well in the coronal plane just to see if the disc has migrated to one side. Because sometimes, you know, the most common thing is that the disc migrates forward. But rarely it can migrate backwards as well, get stuck in the back of the condyle. And sometimes it can migrate slightly or even a lot medially or even laterally, especially medially, to, at least in my experience. But those are things that you look for for here. But remember, 
if you have TMD, the likelihood that it's something very, very aggressive is usually not so high. Most of the patients that call me, and I see a lot of heavy TMD patients, they have disc dislocation, but it's not so often that I get patients like this who have very deteriorated joints. Those are the, 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 the more special cases. So likelihood is, even if you have a lot of pain, that your joint is not damaged like this one is, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about, more about symptoms and treatment, and also an important misconception with regards to treatment, especially with regards to tongue posture. Now, common, you know, TMD, is it difficult to diagnose? I mean, it really isn't. If, you, if you're looking at plain TMD symptoms, pain in the temple, um, pain in the joint itself, clicking, cracking, bursting after chewing and talking, uh, difficulty opening your mouth. It's obviously TMD. It's obviously TMD. This is not rocket science. It can be a little bit more difficult if you're having Costin syndrome. Costin syndrome is basically trigeminal neuralgia that already originates in the auricular temporal nerve, where the auricular temporal nerve is compressed by the condyle. To diagnose something like that, you need to be aware of the notion that TMD can cause that it can cause trigeminal neuralgia. Generally, when a patient has facial pain, they will, that seems to be of, of um, trigeminal origin, they will do a brain MRI, and they will look for looping or aneurysms or tumors that are compressing that, that fifth nerve, that, that trigeminal nerve, intracranially. If there's none of that, they will often be told that this is, you know, this is psychological, this is stress, or whatever you imagine this. Or sometimes if they have a good ENT or relevant physicians, they might be told that this is, this is jaw-related. Although at least in my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, most people are not aware of the actual cost and syndrome, which is that compression of the auricular temporal nerve. But there are some who are aware that TMD, for whatever reason, unknown reason, can cause facial symptoms. Now, as I said, click and cracking of the joint and you're really looking at, when you're diagnosing TMD, you're looking to see if the symptoms that the patient is having can be elicited or is appearing revolving jaw use and loading. So stress in general, chewing and talking, those are the most important things, guys. Okay. Cracking of the joint, pain in the joint, difficulty opening the mouth, pain in the, in the temple, pain in the ear, tinnitus. Tinnitus is very common in TMD. Why? Well, because the trigeminal nerve contributes to the tympanic plexus, co-innervates the eardrum, innervates the tensor tympani muscle, and is a common, not rare, common cause of tinnitus. Okay, so trigeminal compression can also cause dysautonomia, such as tinnitus. In rare cases, it can cause uh, problems with the eyes, where you get excessive lagrimation, nasal discharge, but this is usually reserved to more aggressive patients. You can also get uh, palate symptoms, pain in the palate, pain in the sinuses. You can also feel like a pressure in the sinuses and mimic sinusitis, um, pain in the tongue, changes of taste. Strange symptoms like that can sometimes happen in this because of the influence that TMD can, not always, but can have and commonly does have on the trigeminal nerves. Like I said, the diagnosis, not rocket science, symptoms in, in along with what I just said, it triggers with use and, 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 and loading of stress on the jaw, all right? Now, if you combine stress with craniofacial dystrophy, will that increase your risk of developing TMD? Of course it will. Of course, no, no doubt about it. During the workup, the clinical workup, I obviously, there's a lot of question and, Q and A. You have to ask the right question and see what the patient says. But another thing that I like to do, just palpate the joint, see if it's tender. Palpate both sides. You can palpate the auricular temporal nerve, just behind that, slightly post posterior and inferior to the to the to the joint itself, right behind between the ear and the between the well, just below the tragus and and the rami of the of the mandible. And you push in there. And you see if that hurts a lot. If that hurts a lot, that's not a trigger point, guys. That's the auricular temporal nerve. 
combines compared to side to side. Uh, palpate, palpate the temporalis muscle, palpate the, the, um, the masseter. You can palpate the suprahyoid and look for excessive tension. You can also palpate the lateral pterygoid intraorally. Follow the teeth, the upper teeth along the molars. Move the jaw to one side. And you follow them until you find like a pocket of muscle. Squeeze into that and see how much it hurts. The more it hurts, the weaker the muscle is. Okay. Uh, you should also look at uh, look at the 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 bite of the patient. When they bite on the molars, and if they try to move the jaw slightly back afterwards from that starting position, there should be a slight margin. If there's no margin at all, that means the condyle is situated all the way back when when you are when when you clue the teeth. Okay. Um, another common thing, an important thing to look for, is the way that the patient opens the mouth. Patients with TMD, they will open their mouth with mouth with retraction. So that means that as they open the mouth, they will open it this way. The mouth should open this way. It should open with protraction with the pterygoids. But what we see in these patients is that they open it like this. I cannot even open my mouth properly like that because it's not natural. So it will stop on the ligaments. Now, patients who have done this for many years, they get laxity of the ligaments. So when they open their jaws, you see this popping here. You see this, this bulging of the jaw, which is subluxing a little bit due to ligament dyslaxity. Uh, ligament dyslaxity is not a big issue, really. It's more that an indication that the patient is opening their jaw wrong and needs to correct it. So the jaw should open like this with the pterygoids. Looks like this. It kind of has a motion like this. And this is something that gets more natural as you practice it. But you've got to be careful with this in the beginning because this movement will load the pterygoid a lot. And the pterygoid, not so much in early and mild, you know, mild, moderate TMD patients, but in severe patients, they often have aggressive inflammation of the pterygoid. And this can cause brutal symptoms. And it's something that can, believe it or not, can take years to treat in some cases. The joint is usually much easier to treat than the pterygoids. Now, let's talk about tongue posture. This is a common misconception, guys. Tongue posture, is it, is it important for TMD? <laughs> well, it's certainly important for facial development, very important for facial development. So if you have a child with TMD, it's a little bit difficult because the tongue will support proper, proper growth of the face, but it will also put a lot of load on the pterygoid. And that can make you much worse. This is something that you might have to balance if you're dealing with a child or adolescents, but something that you should probably avoid if you're an adult. So if I have an adult, you see the, the tongue should be up in the roof of the mouth and slightly forward. And when you do that, because the tongue to be able to push that way, it will have to force against something. It will have to push against something to do that and attaches to the hyoid and to the jaw. So when you put your tongue up and forward, it, that will push your jaw back. And you have to withstand that by activating the pterygoids. And if you do that and you have really weak pterygoids and you don't know, that's going to get you in trouble, almost definitively. And if you have severe TMD, that can... Yeah, that's a really bad idea. So what I recommend, I'm all for doing this in kids and adolescents, especially if they don't have any TMD symptoms. But if you're dealing with adults... Or if they have, or even a child or adolescent, if they have severe symptoms, treat the TMD first. Get the pterygoids much stronger. That can take months to years, depending on the case. And once the pterygoids are strong, now you can do the tongue posture. Okay, so so tongue posture as an important treatment factor of TMD? No, no, it's not. It's not. But it's an important factor in the development of the face, and therefore that's very important for kid, kids and adolescents. As an adult, you know, this is a controversial topic a little bit, but the general consensus is that the face doesn't really grow when you're an adult. Personally, I don't really believe it does. All right. There, there's some people who experiment and think that it does. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on the topic of adult uh, development of the, of the facial bones, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, most evidence suggests that it probably doesn't. Okay. Either way, 
if you want to do the tongue posture as an adult, for God's sake, just treat treat the jaw first. Get the pain to go away. Really treat the pterygoids. Get them nice and strong. Then you can do as much practice as much tongue posture as you want. Okay. Now, another important thing, guys, is to find out whether or not the patient is worse in the morning or evening. If they're worse in the morning, it usually suggests that they recover during the day, but they grind during the night. And in those cases, I tend to recommend a mouthpiece that holds the jaw forward. I like the two the, the mouthpieces that even either is one big piece that holds both the upper and lower or two pieces that uses a band system that pulls the jaw forward. I don't like the one pieces for the upper jaw that just, that just lodge onto the lower teeth because you just open your mouth and that jaw will go straight back. So I don't like that. So some kind of device that really holds the lower jaw forward during the night is a very important treatment uh, strategy for that, especially if, it's, if the symptoms are, are, are significant. Uh, if the patient has symptoms of TMD that worsens throughout the day that usually suggests the other the, the, the opposite, i.e. that the patient recovers during the night, but things that they're doing during the day is what's instigating their symptoms. So that could be, you know, that could be uh, clenching your jaw because you have neck pain. It could be clenching because you have um, it could be clenching because you have uh, you have stress. It could be facial dystrophy combined with a lot of talking. Let's say you have a job where you're meetings all day long, things like that of that nature. But um, so it's important to be aware that if your symptoms come during the day, and especially at worse at, at night time or or you know evening, then these are things that you can treat conservatively, whereas or without any 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 devices, so to say. Whereas if you get your symptoms in the morning, you probably need some kind of night piece, mouthpiece during the night to deal with that. I hope that makes sense. Now let's talk about the actual treatment here. Like I already suggested, the, the jaw, what causes TMD in, in its essence is the jaw being too far back. Too far back either due to craniofacial dystrophy and or because it, it can be a combination of stress. And by stress, we're not talking you know, delusion and, and psychiatric illness per se. We're talking about whatever stressor that causes you to clench your jaw, all right? Sometimes this can be due to frank, severe anxiety. Sometimes it's just a little bit of, of stress that manifests in a way that it shouldn't. So the way that I teach this is that the patient should learn to look for and stop their clenching habits. Because treating the stress, that might sometimes not be possible or not feasible or very difficult. Treating anxiety, very difficult. But treating the way that you let this manifest somatically, that's definitely doable. You can definitely learn to identify and stop your clenching habits, although you still might have some social anxiety or whatever. I hope that makes sense. So we want to treat the underlying cause. Um, and we really want to get that jaw slightly forward. When the jaw comes slightly forward, the condyle here, and once again, I hope you can see this, my cursor here, when the jaw comes slightly forward, the, the condyle would drop slightly down and slightly forward. This will decompress the nerve in the back, and it will also decompress the disc, allowing the joint and the nerve to heal. This is a position that we can not chew in, we cannot eat like that, but you can certainly rest or work or talk or drink like that. So 99%, how many, how many minutes do you really eat per day, right? Chew, actively chew. So the vast majority of the day, you will be able to decompress the joint even by itself by just holding your jaw slightly forward. How much? Well, three, four millimeters from baseline. So you just bite, bite together on your molars. And from there, you put it slightly forward, you stay there. It's very important that you do so without super high clenching. I see a lot of patients that when they eat, when they employ this this corrective, that they might not have been so tense to begin with, but then they pull their jaws forward and they start tensing up under here. It's, it won't be as obvious as when I show you because I can make this obvious. It will all very often be completely inconspicuous. So you have to get in there and make sure it's nice and soft while they hold the jaw forward. If they hold the jaw forward and still clench, 
that's not the lasting strategy, all right? Because the pterygoids pull, the, the sorry, the pterygoids pull forward, superhyoids pull back, and now you're fighting yourself. Pterygoids will get much worse. And if they weren't bad to begin with, they will, they, it, a problem will, will develop. And it's not sustainable. You won't be able to ho keep holding your jaw forward like that uh, while fighting yourself. Holding the jaw forward for a patient who has mild affliction is usually quite easy. It might be a little bit of, you know, you have to make up your mind. You have to decide to do this and you might get a little bit of fatigue in your jaw, but it's generally quite tolerable. And a lot of patients of the mild echelon tend to report that they're able to do many hours at a time from the get-go. Whereas patients with medium and especially, you know, severe affliction of TMD, they might have to go as low, you know, I've seen patients that can go five hours and they have to stop because they get facial symptoms. The facial, why would you get facial symptoms if your jaw is forward and you decompress the nerve? Well, usually because the pterygoid gets, gets irritated so quickly because it's extremely weak, okay? And fascicles of the trigeminal nerve, especially the lingual nerve, the buccal nerve, pierces that lateral pterygoid. So if you hold that jaw forward and the muscles are, are you know, have nothing to begin with, and you start using them all day long, severe inflammation can occur. And this is something you need to be really aware of. So some patients, especially if it's more severe to begin with, they might have to hold the jaw forward just five, 10 minutes, take hours of break, do five to 10 minutes more, and gradually increase their work capacity. And this can be something, guys, that can take years in some cases. It can take years. Whereas in mild circumstances, you know, if there's no severe pterygoidal deficit, and it's predominantly a joint issue, you can see great results really quickly in some cases. So this is important to be aware of, guys, because if you're very motivated, but you have an issue with a pterygoid and you ignore that, you keep going, that can cause brutal worsening of your symptoms. Very important topic, guys, okay? Okay, let's see if there's something I forgot here. So, symptoms. Popping, pain in the joint, difficulty opening the jaw, pain in the ear, tinnitus, pain in the eye, pain in the face, sinuses, palate, uh, tongue. You can even see submaxillary symptoms uh, as well in some cases. Uh, and typically instigate either with stress. And when it's with stress, I mean clenching or super high clenching, right? You might not be, probably the patient doesn't know about it, but that's usually the connection there. Why do some people always get back pain? Other people always get headache. Other people always get jaw pain. It depends on how they're letting the stress manifest. I hope that makes sense. Uh, diagnosis, like I said, compatible symptoms, compatible history, compatible triggers. You, you can do a quick manual exam. You're usually going to find something suggestive of TMD. Imaging, remember, the imaging might actually be normal. And it's a sub, you know, you have a, a problem that has clinical, you have a patient with clinical symptoms, but no imaging evidence. Or it might be that the imaging is not bad enough for the clinician to, or for the radiologist to, to notice it. Uh, because let's face it, this is specialty. This is specialty imaging. And unless you treat these patients, it's not so easy to just know from a book what's right or wrong. Okay, I hope I've covered everything here. I think I did. If you have any questions, leave them in the chat box. And uh, happy holidays. And thank you for listening.